difference. Um, the R on time slides. The R on time slides. So uh, I just ask that um, once it moves to the next presenter, you do your real quick five second wrap up and the next presenter, feel free to jump on and begin. So uh, Casey, go ahead. Why don't, why don't we get started? Great. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen with everybody. And let's go ahead and get started with Adrian. So everyone able to, I know not everyone can respond, but hopefully you can all see my screen. Okay. And Adrian, you're on. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Curtin. Uh, I'm here today to introduce you to my experience and research for my collaborative uh, dual PhD with Shanghai Jiao Tong University and Drexel University. Um, as one of the first students in this role, uh, my research focused on using non-invasive neuron technologies such as functional neuroinfrared spectroscopy to reveal the effects of non-invasive brain stimulation, uh, here transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, by combining neuroimaging and neurostimulation together, we are able to see and adapt treatment to individuals and offer new hope to patients for whom therapeutic approaches don't seem to work very well, uh, or pharmaceutical therapeutic approaches. Um, similarly, I would also like to briefly introduce my experience working with my colleagues abroad and share that all with you. Uh, so Shanghai is one of the largest cities. Um, it has actually, and in, indeed in the world, um, it's over, home to over 20 million people and it's a city of great cultural and academic and research importance. Um, Shanghai Jiao Tong University is a very prominent university in the country, and it's one of the older universities that's still in modern China. Uh, so it was founded in 1996. It's often referred to as the MIT of the East. Shanghai Jiao Tong has two campuses. One is located in the downtown in Shuhui District, and there's another suburban campus in the Minhang District, where many of the student facilities and research facilities are. Uh, my project was also a collaboration with the Shanghai Mental Health Center, um, a prominent psychiatric research facility uh, with advanced technologies such as functional magnetic resonance imaging and uh, the TMS and FNIRS I mentioned before, um, as well as other neuroimaging and neurostimulation approaches. Um, this is a photo here of uh, the lab that I worked with under Dr. Shan Bao Tong. And uh, along with some of the um, and uh, they were very, very welcoming and uh, it was a really a great opportunity. Um, if you want to click one more time. Uh, yeah, uh, so I would just all partnership with you and uh, some of the research that we did. <clears throat> uh, major depressive disorder is a very severe and common disorder. Um, it's impacted a lot of people around the world uh, and it's a, a very drastic effect on quality of life. Um, antidepressants have revolutionized the treatment for this. Uh, before that, it was uh, uh, psychotherapy, like Freudian stuff, um, and we've had a lot of uh, opportunity. Uh, but antidepressants don't work on everybody, and uh, individuals still struggle with the disorder. More recently, we've been able to use non-invasive neurostimulation approaches. So in the most common example of this is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, TMS uses electromagnetic oils to activate parts of the brain and use this over time to uh, stimulate uh, prefrontal cortex enable and smooth and suppress the uh, uh, of thoughts, challenges which still remain. Uh, okay. So uh, <laughs> there's significant clinical need for TMS. Um, but one of the problems why it doesn't work or whether why it does. Um, this is especially challenging because there's actually no output from the TMS. When you stimulate other parts of the brain, you receive some sort of feedback. And with a TMS coil, you don't have this insight. Uh, my approach here was to combine TMS with functional near infrared spectroscopy for a multimodal neurostimulation approach. Um, what this would allow us to do is to be able to see some of the effects that we have on uh, the individual who's being stimulated and ideally 
identify responders, non-responders, as well as ideal treatment approaches for the technique. So in this envisioned approach, TMS would be used to stimulate uh, the patient undergoing therapy. That response can then be evaluated with FMIRS, and then that response can then be used to optimize the actual treatment response. Um, in my research, we have shown a, a number of ways in which this technique can be used. Um, some of these areas include uh, the enhancement of cognition, as well as uh, potential uh, to gauge the response based on the, uh, you may go back a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, as well as the, <laughs> the uh, as well as the ability to judge the effect of the TMS treatment based on the magnitude of the FNIRS response uh, measured. Uh, the other applications for this combination of TMS and FNIRS uh, include the application of uh, FNIRS and TMS for schizophrenia, uh, stroke recovery, uh, epilepsy, bipolar disorder, and more. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, work and I'm very proud to be presenting it today. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues at Shanghai Jiatong University, the Shanghai Mental Health Center, uh, my uh, advisors and colleagues here at Drexel University, uh, and I uh, think that's it for today. Uh, thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Katie. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about uh, my research project in the bio department. I'm a at the end of my uh, fourth year in my PhD, which has really flown by. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about what I do, but a little bit more about um, the place that I work and the students that I've been able to bring abroad. Um, because, uh, you know, as the Office of Global Engagement, I think we're really trying to bring uh, this experience to all of our undergrads. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what works for me and maybe that can work for you in the future. So um, the title of my talk is Adult Nutrition is Linked to Social Status and Reproductive Opportunity in a Neotropical Paper Wasp, which is a lot of words that I, I think many of you probably don't um, understand. So I'm going to try to very simply um, give you guys the lowdown on the things that I work on. So we know that uh, in insects, nutrition affects reproductive development. So I want to bring your guys' attention over here to the left-hand side of the screen. Um, so in that photo, you guys will probably recognize a honeybee. Um, it's the most familiar, I think, social insect uh, living together in a group. All the females work together to support the queen, who is that very, very large individual in the middle. Um, and those workers on the outside of her are never able to reproduce. So they are created to help the queen uh, advance her own eggs and, and they eventually die off without ever reproducing. But we know some things about what makes the queen uh, very big. And um, we know that basically larval nutrition is responsible for that. Um, and so uh, we, we can see during their development, the larval stages while they're developing as tiny little baby bees, um, they are fed a specific diet that actually creates very large queens um, and, and then you get also very small workers. Um, so I'm really interested in understanding uh, how this works in species of insects where the queen does not look any different from the workers. So the wasp that I study on the right hand side of your screen um, is actually what we call monomorphic. So all the females look exactly the same. The queen um, is identical in body size to the other workers. And I'm really interested in how adult nutrition might be shaping um, their ability to reproduce. So if um, I could draw your attention to the figure all the way on the right. Um, I'm not gonna bog you down with a graph, but I just wanted to show you guys uh, this on this y-axis. This is basically a measure of the amount of animal tissue that they receive in their diet. And we actually see a very large difference in these females uh, who have developed ovaries versus females who do not have developed ovaries um, in the type of diet that they're receiving. So uh, it seems to be uh, in adulthood, they're basically affected um, by the kind of diet that they're eating. But uh, most importantly, the, the reason why I wanted to talk to you guys today is that um, 
I've really been able to bring undergrads to the field and immerse them into these projects working on wasps, uh, which they're usually very afraid of at the beginning of the field season, uh, but come to love by the end, which is really amazing. Um, so I've spent uh, a few field seasons in Monteverde, Costa Rica, but I've led two on my own um, as an upper level uh, doctoral student. Um, we work specifically in Monteverde, Costa Rica. We live with a family um, who has lived there since the town was built, um, specifically in a house that they own on their farm. Uh, I've been able to take five undergraduate students, two I-STAR students who are freshmen, um, and they've lived abroad with me for an entire month. Um, and that has resulted in four student co-authorships on papers that were submitted to academic, an academic journal, um, which I just received back for some comments. And I've actually had my students apply to both graduate school and uh, working in the biological industry in positions. Um, so I've, I really feel like they have been able to immerse themselves in an experience that they weren't sure about, I think, to begin with, because insects are scary. Um, and a lot of them have gone on to discover new things about themselves uh, and new passions for research. Um, and I really think that this is a valuable opportunity, not only for me as a graduate student to help mentor these students, but for them to develop uh, basically in their academic and personal abilities and uh, immerse themselves in a new place um, and really understand uh, what it means to be a scientist abroad, um, not only doing the work as a biologist, but but also doing the work as a uh, ambassador for you know, Drexel and the United States in a place that they've um, never been before. So I'm really excited to hopefully take some more students before I leave, um, as long as we're allowed to work abroad sometime soon. Um, and I can take any questions that you guys have uh, after this about uh, paper wasps or working abroad, what it's like to bring students abroad um, on a small uh, uh, field team, et cetera. So, um, I appreciate you guys tuning in today, and um, I'm really thankful for the work that I do, and I'm excited to do more of it, so thanks. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Cynthia Clobodou, and I'm a PhD student and a research fellow in the Department of Nutrition Sciences at the College of Nursing and Health Professions. Uh, the title of my presentation today is The Assessment of Maternal Birth Preparedness for Childbirth in Ghana. So a bit of an introduction to uh, maternal um, health in Ghana. Maternal mortality rate is currently um, 310 deaths per 100,000 live births. And we have an, a sustainable development goal of reducing this to 70 deaths per 100,000 live births by the year 2030. But we have an annual reduction rate of about 2.7% versus a required reduction rate of 7.5%. Um, and so um, based on these estimates, it's um, obvious that we are far from achieving our goal. The next slide. Okay, so um, experts have found that um, skilled birth utilization is the single most critical intervention in reducing maternal mortality rates. Um, skilled birth utilization here means that um, being attended to by a skilled birth attendant or anyone, any health professional with uh, midwifery skills. And birth preparedness is one of the strategies that has been identified to promote skilled birth utilization. And it involves making plans for a normal birth. Um, they are generally in, inconsistent and low levels of birth preparedness nationwide. And we also have um, few urban studies conducted in Ghana. Therefore, the study objectives were to determine the levels of birth preparedness and skilled birth utilization using steps adapted from WHO and to assess um, factors associated with birth preparedness. This study was conducted in two urban health facilities and we assessed 300 moms attending um, postnatal clinics in these facilities using a structured questionnaire and we assess their level of birth preparedness for their last pregnancy and also um, their social demographic factors. And the birth preparedness measure was adapted from the WHO and involved uh, the following steps. Uh, could you kindly go back? You can see, um, yeah, making arrangement for transport, making arrangement for someone to care for the home while the mother is away, deciding where to give birth, saving money for care and transport, having a valid health insurance, identifying a blood donor, 
and have a knowledge of 11 danger signs. Um, next topic. So we found that 78% um, of the moms were bed prepared, 98.3% um, utilized skilled birth attendance. So the first graph shows the proportions of the aspects of um, bed preparedness. And you can see that um, the most prepared for aspect was having a valid health insurance, whereas the least uh, prepared for was making arrangement for a blood donor. So Ghana's um, National Health Insurance Scheme offers free maternal care services, and this could have um, contributed to the high, high proportions of preparedness in this aspect. Also, we have um, a lot of social cultural perception concerning blood donation and reception in Ghana, and this could have hindered a, a section of people from deciding to um, receive or um, give blood in spite of our high levels of um, iron deficiency anemia. And so the second graph uh, displays the data a bit differently in terms of proportions of the individual aspects of whether women were prepared or not prepared. So we found that um, factors that increased um, bed preparedness were having four or more antenatal clinic visits um, during the last pregnancy, belonging to maternal health promoting clubs or groups during the last pregnancy, and also um, maternal employment. So our take home message today is that um, multiple factors affect uh, bed preparedness and that um, health professionals should be encouraged to um, routinely assess maternal bed preparedness during our prenatal visits. Um, thank you, and um, I'll take questions later. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ariana Levitt, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and I'm co-advised by Professor Yuri Gagotsi, the director of the AJ Drexel Nanomaterials Institute, and Professor jean vierre Dion, the director of the Center for Functional Fabrics. And we've been working collaboratively with Deakin University, uh, in particular, Professor Joe Rizal's group uh, in Geelong, Australia, to develop textile devices using Maxine-based fibers and yarns. So the motivation behind this work is to develop textiles for soldiers, for patients, for athletes that are capable of storing energy, harvesting energy, sensing body movements, pressure, um, to really be an interface between the wearer and the world around them. And in order to develop these kinds of textile devices, we need to first synthesize a material that has these functionalities, being able to store energy or conduct electricity, and then integrate them into fibers and yarns to create these functional fibers, and then knit them or weave, weave them into real uh, textile devices or garments. And Drexel and Deakin University are particularly well suited uh, for this task because at Drexel, we have expertise in synthesizing Maxine, which is a large family of two-dimensional materials with really unique optical and electronic properties. And at Deakin, they have uh, expertise in developing large scale functional fibers. And at the Center for Functional Fabrics, we have real textile manufacturing equipment. Wow. So back in 2018, I um, accepted a fellowship through the Australian Academy of Sciences to um, go over to Deakin and work on the development of these textile devices. So I first synthesized Maxine at Drexel, brought it over to Deakin, you can see here on the top right is a picture of me in their fiber manufacturing uh, facility uh, where I coated Maxine onto commercial fibers and yarns. And then I brought those fibers and yarns back to uh, Drexel to knit real textile devices. Next slide, cool. Casey. Oh, thank you. Um, so on the left here, you can see a variety of different Maxine-based fibers and yarns that we've worked on. So at the top here, you can see the Maxine-coated yarns that I just mentioned. And then in the middle, you can see images of fibers that were produced through electrospinning, which is a method uh, used to make really fine fibers or nanofibers. 
And at the bottom here, you can see these are fibers that were made through another process called wet spinning. And this was led by Professor Cheyenne Sayedin, or sorry, Dr. Cheyenne Sayedin, who uh, was a postdoc in Dr. Rizal's group at the time, who was visiting Drexel to conduct research when I was visiting Deakin. So after scaling up these fibers and yarns, we've knitted them into real textile devices. So as you can see on the top right here, this is an image of a textile energy storage device. And on the bottom here, this is a textile strain sensor that was designed to be an elbow, elbow sleeve to monitor bending and movement of the elbow. So this has been a very fruitful collaboration leading to many publications, grants, and fellowships. And the collaboration is still ongoing as we're constantly generating new research ideas. So I would like to thank uh, the Center for Functional Fabrics and the Nanomaterials Research Group here at Drexel and Professor Joe Rizal and his team at Deakin. And you can see in the background here, this is an image that I took uh, just a short drive away from the campus in Australia. It's an image of the 12 Apostles, which is one of Australia's great landmarks. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hagar Mohammed, a PhD student in the Microbiology and Immunology program at Drexel. My project investigates how non-thermal plasma can be applied to HIV-1 infection, and I completed part of it abroad. So I would first like to thank the Office of Global Engagement and Education Abroad for providing a travel grant to allow me to accomplish this study, which was done with our collaborators at the Leibniz Institute for Plasma Science and Technology in Greifswald, Germany, in the labs of Dr. Sondra Bikishus and Dr. Christian Wendy. And I'll be discussing some of the work we did, which we hope would lead towards a development of a cure for HIV-1 infection. Next slide, please. Okay. Over 30 million people worldwide are living with HIV-1 infection, a disease that causes loss of CD4 T cells, which are the target of HIV-1 replication. And when viral replication greatly increases, patients progress to AIDS. To prevent AIDS, many patients are on antiretroviral therapy, or ART. It's a treatment regimen composed of different antiviral drugs, which suppresses viral replication and results in the recovery of CD4 T cells. However, even in patients on ART, infection is lifelong because infected cells are not very immunogenic, meaning they fail to stimulate an immune response. This is because some of the cells are latently infected, so they don't produce virus and are essentially hidden from the immune system. Also, this is because uh, those producing virus are not efficiently targeted and eliminated by cells of the innate and adaptive immune system. To circumvent, to circumvent these issues, we propose a novel approach in which HIV-1 infected cells can be exposed to non-thermal plasma, or NTP. And this is an ionized gas composed of various reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, or RNS, that induces oxidative stress in cells. NTP is also referred to as cold plasma. And it has been shown to increase targeting by innate cells and subsequent T cell mediated protection from disease in vivo for different cancer models. We investigated cold plasma mediated enhancement of, immun of immunogenicity in our study using the JLOT cell line, which serves as a model for latent HIV-1 infection. We applied cold plasma to these cells in culture and investigated the occurrence of several markers of immunogenicity, including EatMe and pro-inflammatory markers many of which are also character, ca categorized as markers of immunogenic cell death. These studies with pro-inflammatory cytokine release are still ongoing. We also analyzed how cold plasma affects antigenicity by assaying for surface expression of molecules critical for recognition of infected cells by T cells. And we assayed for these markers primarily by flow cytometry. The JLAT cell line allows us to check whether HIV-1 gene expression is stimulated using GFP expression as a readout. Um, so we saw that when cold plasma is applied to these cells, beginning at the top left figure here, there is a dose-dependent increase in the GFP positive population, suggesting that cold plasma may stimulate HIV-1 gene expression in this latent infection model. We also saw that cold plasma greatly increases the display of prophagocytic or eat me ICD markers, as shown in the next figure on the right here. And the majority of this population was double positive for GFP, suggesting that cold plasma may promote better targeting of HIV-1 infected cells. We also did a phagocytosis assay with these cold plasma exposed cells, which were pre-labeled with cell trace violet or CTV and co-cultured with THP1 macrophages that were pre-labeled with HLA-DR antibody, as shown on the bottom here. And we saw that cold plasma exposed cells were more efficiently phagocytosed by THP1 than untreated cells. 
And this is shown also here in the images with THP1 cells engulfing JLOT cells. When we assessed colplasma-mediated effects on antigenicity, we saw that there was a modest increase in MHC1 and co-stimulatory molecule CD28 and OX40. And further assessment in co-cultures with CD8T cells can determine whether this would enhance recognition and targeting of these colplasma-exposed cells. Altogether, this data suggests that cold plasma can be used to enhance multiple markers of immunogenicity in our model, including stimulation of HIV-1 gene expression, efficient uptake by innate immune cells, and modulation of surface expression of MHC1 and co-stimulatory molecules, which we hope to see correlate with efficient antigen recognition and an induction of an adaptive immune response in subsequent studies. We hope that data from future studies can support an approach where infected patient cells are obtained, exposed to cold plasma ex vivo, that administered back to the patient to induce a strong, innate, and adaptive immune response that allows control of HIV-1 infection without the need for drugs. And thank you for your attention. Um, hi, I'm Carmi. I'm a first-year PhD student in the lab of Dr. Sean O'Donnell. And with the support of the Department of Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science, and also the Office of Global Engagement and Study Abroad, uh, I traveled to the Negev Desert of Israel to dig a bunch of holes in order to study the neuroanatomy of a social and terrestrial crustacean. Uh, just a little thanks to my lab mates and collaborators as well. Uh, so in December of 2019, I traveled to Israel and headed south down a very windy road into the desert, spent several days digging holes in the sand, and uh, luckily I found what I was looking for, which you can see in photo one, and that is a handful of bugs. So the study organism for my PhD research is named Hemilopistis remori, which you can see in photo four. <laughs> it's a land-dwelling land crustacean, and it's in the same suborder as the common isopod that you might know as roly polies or pill bugs or potato bugs, all of which you can find in your own backyard. But unlike the roly polies, which you find in your backyard, uh, the isopod that I'm interested in is only found in remote areas of Africa and the Middle East. Uh, this isopod is found um, in family burrows underground. And as you can see in my drawing number two, um, that is a little depiction of what their family burrows look like. Uh, in video number three, Q video three, uh, <laughs> you can see that they're collectively um, removing some of their um, pellets from their family burrow. And this is also a video of the field site in Israel. So this uh, isopod is remarkably the only crustacean that has been reported to have both parents active in cooperative care of their offspring. And I propose to use this species for, as a model for understanding the relationship between brain architecture and social behavior of uh, parental care. So I'm really excited about studying this species, especially because as you can see in photo number five, uh, they survived really well during a pilot study in which I kept the isopods in captivity inside of hummus containers, and they will therefore be excellent subjects for behavioral experiments inside the lab. So my primary mission for this trip to Israel was to, first of all, locate those isopods and bring them back to Drexel so that I could preserve them, slice, and stain their brain tissue. So the samples that I brought back to Israel supported a scientific illustration project of Dada Njai, who's a talented undergraduate student at Drexel. Together, we're working on filling in the gaps uh, in knowledge that we have about the structure of this specific species of isopods brain. Um, so we're focusing on locating centers of the brain that are related to learning and memory. And this will be necessary for my future plans to alter elements of their social structure and observe whether there's plasticity in brain architecture throughout their life cycle. So um, the unique behavior that I will be focusing on uh, in the future will be parental care. But our exploratory process starts uh, with the whole isopod, which you can see in figure one. And then we separate the head, as you can see in figure two, and very carefully remove the cuticle to expose the brain, which is highlighted in red in figure three. So then this tissue is fixed, embedded in resin, and partitioned into extremely thin slices and stained blue in order to differentiate between different types of tissue. So the resulting image is figure five. 
And uh, there I've, um, you can see the brain tissue highlighted with the red line and the rest of the head with those dark blue circles is actually very impressively all muscle tissue. So in figure four, you can see that Dauda illustrated the location of brain tissue inside the head uh, based on our dissections. In figure six, down at the bottom right, you can um, Dauda use the literature to interpret the location of the nervous system inside the entire body of the isopod. And then um, in those nested, three nested photos, A, B, and C, you can see um, that Dauda used our slice brain tissue to locate and describe the anterior, middle, and posterior brain region. So with this illustration, exploration of isopod architecture, we'll gain a deeper understanding of this organism through what I would call a sort of visual meditation and repetition. So sketching and resketching, which I think is a really useful process, especially at the beginning of a research project. So um, we'll end up having illustrations that can be used to communicate our future findings and also make a lesser known arthropod more approachable. So stay tuned to what I dig up in future holes. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lien. Uh, I'm a third year student, PhD student at Drexel University now. Um, and my interest is in macroeconomics with a focus on labor market. So as you all know, the COVID-19 has a lot of implication on the labor market um, recently. So um, this is a joint work with Professor Andre Kerman from Drexel University and Etienne Lallet from the University of Quebec, uh, Montreal. And the purpose of the paper is to um, study the impact of COVID-19 on small business. Um, especially we focus on employment and hours and um, we use the data from home base um, provider. So a little bit background on what home base data is and why we choose to use them. Um, home base is a scheduling and time block um, software provider and uh, technically they would have their client would be um, businesses in the uh, in a service sector mostly and they would record the hour work of every employee. So each employee has a unique user ID and each um, establishment we call, um, or you can think about each um, location has a unique location ID um, and each company has a unique company ID. So um, we use the data provided by Homebase to study the daily hours um, and daily working hours for um, more than 60,000 bus 60, businesses. Um, and we focus on the service sector only because we think that they are the most um, partly hit by the COVID-19. Um, and we augmented the information from home base with the next industry code by matching establishment information with a safe graph place um, of interest database. So a little bit um, intro into what the next code is. So we, the, the, the whole economy of US and you know, worldwide are divided into different industries. You can have leisure and hospitality, um, like hotel um, industry, for example, or you can have food and drink. So each industry is represented by a unique next code and usually it's a six digit. Um, we limit our focus um, or we kind of like um, limit the next code to the first three digit uh, for a broader industry classification because we think that is uh, the most appropriate way to go. Um, and out of all the industry that we have in home base data and we, our primary focus is on the four industry, leisure and hospitality, education and health services, um, retail and trade, uh, professional business and other services. Um, so uh, the key results from our current research, this is still an ongoing research, so um, we would still have a lot of refinement to do, but here is the results that we have right now. So um, the first result we have is that employment contracted by an estimated of 23 million, and which is um, on average a 60% decline in the four industry that we're, um, we were interested in. So this is a little bit um, higher number than what the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, put out, but it's more consistent with the number of um, unemployment, uh, uh, unemployment uh, 
blame that were filed in mid March to late April, um, which were about 33 million. So this statistic suggests that maybe the number put out by the Bureau of um, Labor Statistics uh, hugely underestimate the impact of COVID-19 on the labor market. And we think, uh, and we think the, the main reason was that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, um, they they put out a number or they they, they measure the, the, the employment uh, only focusing on the continuing establishment. So they require the establishment in their sample to be existed in both time T minus one and time T, meaning that they only consider the employment reduction of continuing establishment. Whereas in our sample, then we own, uh, then we um, decompose it into two components. The first one is by continuing establishment as the BLS does, and the second one by um, uh, establishment becoming inactive, meaning even if, um, if a, a company or, or, or um, a location that were active in time T minus one, but disappear in time T, that means we um, categorize that as temporary shutdown. And um, as I say before, that's the main reason why our numbers are a little bit higher but also because our samples contain a mostly small business, which could be hit harder than larger businesses in the presence of the pandemic. We also found out that most of the decline in employment and hours worked occur in the second half of March, which is interesting because that's the time that most of the state um, implement the stay at home order. So we think that the decline in employment and um, hours were, were due to the inactivity of businesses uh, because they were forced closure. Um, and since mid-April, around 30% of closed businesses has reopened and this is consistent with the time that the stay-at-home order was relaxed. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, some um, last note. And we also found that the average weekly hours declined sharply in second half of March, uh, consistent with the stay-at-home order, um, but have lastly um, recovered since then. And we also found that the recall employees worked substantially fewer hours before they were laid off. Um, and we are still have an ongoing um, effort to study more on recall um, or new hire uh, of the businesses, and hopefully we'll put more some results in the coming week. Thank you for being here today, and I'm really glad that I can share my uh, research with everyone. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Professor Jordan Fisher. I'm a professor at the Thomas R. Klein School of Law. Um, I am also a pro uh, professor at uh, Laveau College of Business. Um, and I'm a practicing attorney, so none of this is legal advice. Um, and so what I have been looking at and researching is on the challenges and opportunities in US federal privacy law. Um, and it's a really unique time to be looking at federal privacy law because the current US privacy law environment is very fragmented. We have a number of different states that are, um, and we can actually advance the slide, I don't know why it's not advancing. Um, there's a number, you can keep advancing it. Um, there's a number of different um, US state laws that are causing a lot of fragmentation in the privacy law framework. Um, and so there's both federal and state legislation that often overlaps. It's evolving because we have states that are inputting new privacy laws into this entire framework. The one that is probably most well known is the California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA. And it's also very complex because we have a digital economy that does not see any borders, but then we have laws that do have borders and are looking to protect the citizens that sit within those borders. And so we also have the concepts of preemption between federal and state law. And all of this is overlaid with um, uh, the, the, the complexity where we have a lot of international laws that have more comprehensive, federal, uh, comprehensive privacy laws. Um, and we don't have that same thing in the United States. You can go to the next slide. So my research has really focused on looking at the challenges and opportunities in the U.S. when it comes to creating a federal privacy law um, or a more comprehensive approach to privacy across the entire United States. And the U.S. is uniquely positioned because there are a number of challenges, but there's also some unique opportunities that we can offer with our current legal frameworks that we have in place. So one of the challenges is that 
historically, we have had a very economic approach to privacy with the use of contracts, agreements, terms of service, privacy notices to establish the way in which consumers will interact with businesses. The challenge with that in the current environment is that there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lack of information to be able to make informed decisions, and there's a lack of equal bargaining power between these tech behemoths and the individuals who are using those services. Another challenge is the concepts of preemption and federalism. Because we have states that have some autonomy in regulating the space, as well as federal um, regulations that are dealing with privacy, there's a potential for conflicts and not to have a seamless transition to creating a more comprehensive approach that we might see in other jurisdictions. However, even with these challenges, there are opportunities that the U.S. presents. We already have the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, that is heavily enforcing privacy across the entire United States. And we could harness what's going on at the FTC to create a single federal privacy authority that would oversee privacy across all of the United States at the federal and state level. We also have a very strong judicial system that can be used to promote privacy, and in fact has been promoting privacy, especially when it comes to privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government. So we have a lot of case law and a lot of um, historical precedents that we can rely on in the judicial system to promote privacy um, once we, once we have something in place. The real challenge is gonna be creating a privacy solution that balances innovation, individual rights, and transparency. And that's a challenge both for the United States and globally, because this is not an area that lends itself well to simple solutions, and there's a lot of complexity that is involved. It involves a lot of large businesses, it involves a lot of individual rights, and because digital, the digital economy crosses borders, it's inherently going to involve diplomacy and international collaboration. Ultimately, in creating a solution, the US is going to need to better understand what it wants to protect in privacy and develop a solution that focuses on that. We do not in the United States have a right to privacy. Our constitution does not even mention the term privacy. And so we as a society need to understand privacy in order to determine how we want to legally protect it. If you go to the next slide. Um, in amongst all of this research, one of the challenges we see is the fact that COVID-19 has happened and it is creating a new emphasis on privacy at the federal level. Um, prior to COVID-19, we had a number of different privacy laws that had been proposed at the federal level, none of which have moved significantly forward. Now, in light of COVID-19, we have very specific COVID-19 privacy laws that are being considered at the federal level. And as you can see, we already have competing privacy bills at the federal level. And the current crisis is really highlighting the fact that because we do not have a more comprehensive approach to privacy in the United States, it is really challenging for our country to understand how and what we need to protect in privacy, especially when we're looking at using technological solutions to help mitigate the risks that are going on right now. So this is a really interesting area. It's evolving rapidly. Um, if you are interested in this, I will say um, Drexel has currently submitted in the recent Global Legal Hackathon a submission on privacy and statistical analysis. And I have a book chapter coming out later this year that fully goes into all of these issues. So thank you, everyone. Hi, first of all, I wanna thank you for the opportunity for the fifth annual International Research Showcase. I mean, all these student and faculty presentations have literally just been amazing, um, such amazing works. So I'm Dr. Veronica Carey. I'm the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, also Associate Clinical Professor within Behavioral Health Counseling, and I'm the Chair of the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association, which is both national and international. So my academic attention um, since 2013 has been in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia with respect to the implementation of recovery-oriented practices in mental health. So according to the WHO, International Classifications of Disease, the IDC-10, mental health diagnoses rates in America are about 45.1 million Americans adults with serious and persistent mental health disorders, about 11.1 million. So 25% of all US adults have a mental health disorder with at least 50% of US adults will develop one mental health disorder during a lifetime. 
And of course, this is COVID-19 notwithstanding. So in 2018, internationally, it was estimated that 792 million individuals will live with a mental health disorder, slightly more than one in 10 persons. And this is based on prevalence. This is not necessarily based on diagnosis data. So one of the things that I looked at when I was doing my behavioral health um, exploration is I was looking at systems in the areas addressed, namely Singapore and Karachi. And here you'll see an illustration of uh, Karachi, Pakistan. Um, and that their systems were not inadequate as much as incomplete for attention to persons who are more stable in the community with a diagnosis for how to regain age appropriate roles in the community. So remaining vertical in the community talks about how mental illness does not discriminate as the figures that I shared earlier. The F word in mental health is the ability to function. And this is something that is focused upon within our student uh, training and my international attention, that the ability to function means the ability to live, learn, work, and socialize, that means life, and to be able to exist within individuals' lives based on their own culture, their own practices, and their own definition of community. So my attention strategies have been education. They've been also training focused. I have utilized webinars. I've done face-to-face -face trainings in the various countries. Uh, I've done TV international guest spots in order to uh, get the community to be more comfortable with the idea that recovery does exist. In most countries, people, and even in the US, individuals define recovery as the absence of the illness, when in, uh, with respect to recovery as it's defined in mental health, it means living with a named disorder. So recovery-oriented services exist alongside clinical services. In other words, they, don't, they, they coincide, they don't compete. So in order to remain vertical, which is the way that not just individuals with a mental health diagnosis exist, it is the way all living individuals in terms of humans exist. So and it is vertical in, entails three prongs. It means that you have a plethora of skills, you utilize many, many, many resources, and you begin to develop supports. So as I have been supporting engendering and the implementation of recovery-oriented strategies in these countries, I have been able to do that with respect to looking at it from those three perspectives, skills, resources, and supports. So this is true of all humans, as I mentioned, nationally and internationally. The work I have done in Pakistan, Korea, Egypt, Singapore is to, met, to implement these recovery-oriented services. And the goal, again, is to function successfully in the community. So I want to thank the Recovery, um, the Psych Rehab um, Association, the Recovery House, which is a uh, psychiatric rehabilitation program in Pakistan, the Haogang Center in Singapore, as well as in March of 2021, I was just awarded the Reciprocal Exchange and Mandela Fellows Award, and I will be taking this implementation strategy to Burundi, Africa as well. So for those individuals diagnosed with adult uh, mental health disorders, these are countries that are looking to implement psychiatric rehabilitation as an evidence-based strategy, but recovery-oriented as a method by which to support their needs and goals. So I would like to thank you. Hi, I'm Jody Cataline, and I am um, here to talk about the, I'm just making sure I'm unmuted. You're good. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. I was trying to move the screens back. I'm Jody Cataline. I'm a clinical professor in Lebo College of Business. Thank you, Adam, for saving me. I'm here to talk about a collaboration of three universities who met in Berlin, Germany last summer of 2019 and worked on a person-to-person -person, um, extension of a global classroom slash ICA. 
Okay, so you can slip. Okay. Um, so I just put down some pictures. So the theme of uh, what work I'm doing, I'm trying to enhance the student experience in my department, which is general business. And I'm responsible for teaching first year freshmen in a foundations of business program. I've been doing this for 20 years and started implementing a global classroom element six years ago. It started with the University of Leeds in the UK, and then I found another partner in Germany. So we've been running global classrooms with our foundations of business students, um, you know, virtually doing a collaboration on a marketing project. Again, first year freshmen, so it was a great introduction into Drexel. It was really well received and the students seemed to really like it. It evolved so much that the students were interested in beginning travel. So we started doing ICAs or the intensive courses abroad as an option for some of these students. And again, um, with expressed interest, both from faculty and from the students, we figured out that we could somehow create a true virtual class, a true face-to-face -face classroom with all of these virtual exchanges. And we did that in a triad, the first triad, I believe that was run um, at the university, though I may be corrected. Um, but at least in the College of Business for sure. So last summer we brought uh, 15 Drexel students, eight Leeds students, University of Leeds joined us there, and we met up with 23 German students and did an international project, uh, a consulting project for two startup companies, or a little bit further along than startup companies, uh, that were housed in Siemens City and their global incubator. So uh, you'll see pictures of students presenting. Those students collaborated together, but they were also um, put in teams together. So there were no um, students that were all Drexel students. There were no students that were all uh, students from Germany. So they got over some cultural barriers. They got over some communication barriers for sure. And they were able to successfully collaborate on this. The idea of this is to do learning outcomes and to see assessment and to see um, you know, what they're learning, taking away through reflective analysis after the project is over. So we've been doing research, a colleague and I have been doing research, um, basically collecting data, collecting reflective data, and then uh, subsequently presenting that on that in other conferences. So if we flip this slide, oh, there it goes. Um, what happened next? So on the left-hand side of this slide, I just wanted to kind of highlight the two companies that we did these group projects with. Um, so because we had such a wide variety of students and so many in volume, uh, what we did was we had two ha happy customers. So one of them was called Easy Cook Asia. Um, they were looking to do a global expansion and they were looking at two primary markets. One happened to be in England, so the University of Leeds students were able to add their own um, knowledge into that. And the other was going into the US market. So we were able to give them a varying presentations. So we gave 12 presentations in all, so six for Easy Cook Asia, going over six areas where they could expand in both the US and uh, UK markets. And then we also uh, had another project with a company named Sun Crafter. Uh, they basically take solar energy uh, panels that are thrown away in landfills and they recycle, recycle them and refurbish them to, to generate additional power in, different, in a different capacity. So they wanted to figure out where they could expand in the global market. They also received six presentations with various team members from the three universities. Uh, both partners, both uh, consulting project partners were very, very happy with the outcome. And then what happened next was it was such a successful experience and because we were actually working in the city of Berlin and working closely with the Berlin School of Economics and Law, which was our global partner, um, we had learned yesterday that they were able to secure a grant um, through their government for funding. So they are designating uh, for us 25,000 euro uh, to continue on with another type of uh, learning experience, again, travel oriented, uh, so that we can continue on with these global classrooms slash intensive courses abroad slash international intercultural partnerships. Uh, they're trying to develop a tool with their grant called TULIP, 
um, we are going to be on board with this. But I wanted to present on this to show that there is, um, even through the classroom, just adding some variety of experiences for students, enhancing their learning experience in the classroom. It can evolve into much more, um, and it has, and we've been able to publish, present in terms of our own research, but also the students have gotten that experience of having communication, culture, and collaboration on their resumes. Hello, good morning everybody, and thank you for being here and for all of these wonderful presentations today. Uh, my name is Jane Clarity. I'm an associate professor in the Drexel Dorn Seif School of Public. And also on the line today, today is Sheila Tripathi, who was a postdoc in my lab until very recently and is now doing her second postdoc at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'll be presenting on some work that we did together in Auckland, New Zealand with our colleagues there who are based at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research related to ports, uh, air pollution, emissions from the ports area in Auckland. Next slide, please. So to get us started, um, Auckland, New Zealand is a very rapidly growing city. It, it's a large Western city of about a million people, um, but rapidly growing population with a large and growing shipping port immediately adjacent to its CBD or central business district. Um, Auckland is in the midst of a major redevelopment plan to try to create the world's most livable city. It's a very beautiful city in a very beautiful country, but they do have this unusual situation of having very large shipping ports immediately adjacent to their downtown. So waterfront air quality has become something of a concern. So we conducted a pilot study with our colleagues at NIWA in February through April 2018. Um, and of course, it is the opposite seasons there. So that is... Uh, our, our winter to early spring, um, it is their summer to early fall. Um, and we aim to examine the effects of ports related activity or locations on air pollution across the area as it may be affecting the dense residential and commercial activity in the CBD. We performed a spatial saturation monitoring, which is basically high spatial density air pollution sampling, looking for sulfur dioxide as a tracer of ports related emission sources and fine particulate matter, which is an important component of traffic-related pollution, as well as a number of other uh, pollution sources. And we selected the sites based on varying proximity to the ports to capture good coverage throughout the central business district, placed all the monitors at about eight to 10 feet on telephone poles, using grad co-passive samplers for sulfur dioxide, and Harvard impactors with programmable pumps to capture PM 2.5 with precision. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so we found, um, as expected, that there was a distinct decay in PM 2.5 concentrations as we move further away from the coast, as indicated in the scatter plot on the left. Um, and after controlling for the week of sampling, we found that an additional 62% of variability in concentrations in PM 2.5 were explained by distance to the coast, which in this case is effectively distance from the ports. Um, in sulfur dioxide, as indicated in the pattern to the right, you can see that we did distinctly um, and consistently find higher concentrations in SO2 closer to the ports and particularly near the ferry terminals. Um, and they do still have some diesel burning ferries there. Um, with decays uh, in concentrations moving further away from the ports area and across the CBD. Uh, the results by combining the uh, source specific indications that SO2 gave us with a dense spatial saturation, we were to able to indicate that quite a substantial amount of the pollution in the area was indeed associated with ports activities, that is both the ships themselves and the ferries, as well as diesel related activities right alongside the ports. And um, we were able to distinguish that from other source effects throughout the CBD, such as, for example, general traffic activity or bus activity. So the approach indicates that there would be some potential benefits to air quality from substantial improvement um, in reducing emissions from shipping and ports related activity. Um, this is a very important um, and delicate political point in New Zealand because it is a very small 
um, but rapidly growing Western country with effectively no manufacturing within the country. So literally everything is imported. And um, as a result, New Zealand is uh, in many ways quite reliant on, on its shipping industry and on its ports. So there have been hesitances there historically to exert the same controls that larger countries like ours can control um, in encouraging uh, uh, shipping emissions to uh, be reduced in and around ports areas um, and effectively for, for fuel switching within um, shorter distances to the ports. So the data and maps that we've derived here will be shared with Auckland Council and with our colleagues in New Zealand. Um, and in more recent days, our colleagues there have continued to monitor air quality throughout the CBD during the COVID-19 lockdown in New Zealand. Um, and they have been very strict in their lockdown and extremely effective in uh, curtailing the spread of COVID-19 there. And one of the interesting things that they have observed is a very distinct decrease in air pollution exposures and concentrations throughout the CBD area during the lockdown. So with that, thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Paul Flanagan and I'm also presenting with a co-presenter, Jim Gopal. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview and then Jim will come in and I'll finish with a little bit about Singapore. Um, I got started in this field. I've been 25 years in corporate America. Both Jim and I are professors at uh, Drexel uh, Klein School of Law and Jim also teaches at uh, LeBeau College of Business. Um, uh, uh, we've been working on this concept of uh, defensible cybersecurity and um, the two of us here came up with this next slide and Jim, I'll let you go on that one. Sure, thanks Paul. So uh, as you heard from uh, from Jordan earlier today, Professor Fisher, you know, information technology is really the lifeblood of the world's economy, right? It, it, it is, without it, none of the research that you're seeing today would be possible. Um, nothing that happens today really um, doesn't depend on some form of cybersecurity and, and information flow. So data breaches happen all the time. If you're like me and you're following the news on these topics, it seems like almost every day you hear about a major breach. And with my clients, I know um, even some of the smaller ones, you see it happen pretty regularly as well. And one of the things that, that a lot of smaller businesses see as frustrating is that um, we're expecting perfection, or at least they, they have this perception that we're expecting perfection. And we need to stop doing that. We need to, to change the way that we look at cybersecurity and, and data privacy. And rather than expecting people to, to have perfect security, uh, we really need to do things that will um, cause them to, to take a more balanced and risk-based approach to cybersecurity. And in order to do that, what you really need to do is demonstrate that the organization has built these concepts into their DNA. So security by design and privacy by design concepts are actually adopted by the organization. And how do you do that? How do you demonstrate that is a lot of the work that Paul and I have been doing um, and really trying to, to flesh that out in more detail. And those are things like putting in place a good enterprise risk management program. Um, and fundamentally, that's what, what underlies all of this. Um, and that means that you're tracking risks, which is something that if you're familiar with risk management, uh, that the risk definition piece is something that organizations do regularly and they'll even add new risks to what they call a risk register. But then um, that kind of is where everything stops. And what we're advocating and what we're, we're really helping people to develop are techniques for creating policies and procedures that just describe how all of that's supposed to be um, dealt with, how those risks are supposed to be dealt with internally. Um, and then from those, how you build a compliance program that actually validates that everything is happening properly and the audit programs that go in place to ensure that, that all of that is happening um, and being done properly within uh, the entire organization. Paul, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, I wanted to also just mention Jim. Jim's also a Professor Gopal's uh, the CEO of Fathom Cyber, a, a cybersecurity risk management consulting company. He's a board member also of the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Accreditation Body, a nonprofit organization helping the U.S. Department of Defense improve its approach to supply chain risk management. The reason that's important is because when I put this together, I, I won a Fulbright, and the Fulbright allowed me to go to Singapore, and that's really what the international part of this presentation is about. Jim and I worked together and I put together a presentation and was awarded the Fulbright to go out to Singapore. Singapore's a neat place. Um, it's, a, it's a city state. I thought it was uh, much larger than it was. It's actually very tiny. 
uh, I could get from one side to the other within an hour. I, I went out there this last uh, August uh, to October and spent six weeks presenting this model to them. And um, the good news is that and the National University of Singapore is always considered to be in the top three uh, in all of Asia. It's a Harvard of, of basically of Asia. And to go out there and teach in front of them um, was really quite an interesting thing. Uh, compliance has been my specialty, and they are truly one of the most compliant countries in the world in almost everything they do. Um, so it was quite a, a you know a, a, an experience to go out there to Singapore and get to know their culture and get to know also why they are the way they are. And we, the the, the research went so well that they asked us to write a, a law review article for them that uh, uh, Professor Gopal and I did do uh, with two other law students, and that will be published uh, in August, and I'm sorry, in, yeah, in August of this year. And they also invited uh, me to come out in 2021 to go back out again. In addition to that, this research that we're doing, um, the LexisNexis uh, sees this as a valuable approach to take on the risk of cybersecurity. And we'll be writing a book on this um, and be published hopefully in May of uh, 2021. Um, that's the exciting part of this and uh, the, the research that we're doing we think will have an impact on the way cybersecurity uh, is addressed in the future. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Martin Jarmick and I teach at the Westfall College of Media Arts and Design. Um, first, just a couple of general comments. Um, this research was conducted and published in 2019 in association with the University of Washington in Seattle at the DX Arts Department. And this is a research-based fine arts program focused on studio practice in emerging technology. And the artwork component of the work has been exhibited in the US and Brazil. The virtual reality platform presents artistic problems in agency, interaction, and narrative and this research addresses them with two primary components. The first is the production of the uh, experimental cinematic VR artwork. And then two, a written discussion focused on the subjective spatial dimension of immersion. And this slide shows a series of moments from the artwork, which is entitled The Final Image. And the project, it integrates stereoscopic 3D panoramas interactive spaces, voiceovers, and soundscapes to form a navigable visual sonic experience about recollections of home and an inner journey towards clarity. The written framework supporting this project defines immersion as a fusion of agency and environment and problematizes the embodied nature of VR um, display as a phenomenological site characterized by plurality of senses, consciousness, and mobility. Um, works of cinema, literature, visual art, and electronic games illustrate classic and contemporary media theories and inspire the content and systems of the production. The project presents three primary artistic problems, cinematic immersion, the subjective spatial dimension of immersion, and then interactive or navigable structure in narrative. And for the area of cinematic immersion, parallels are drawn between the continuous and navigable nature of VR and the extended shot durations and deep depth of fields in cinema, where each of those enable viewer presence and choice. The cinematic cues in light, sound, and movement, they become the primary means of direction in the absence of montage and pictorial borders. And in this project, in the final image, illumination of the environment and legibility of the narrative steer the experience and correlate to audience feedback. In discussing this subjective spatial dimension of immersion, the Rukin figure, or translated as figure from behind, is an artistic device from the Romantic era of painting and proves a useful approach to VR perspective since the audience is essentially an embodied vantage point. Um, the Rukin figure evokes a point of view for the audience to inhabit, pushing the rendered environment beyond an observed object and instead into a perceived and emotive space linked to consciousness. In addition, a discussion and perspective in modern literature provides useful models for a problem central to VR narrative, which is with who eyes does the viewer see the world and how can their point of view be personified and expressed. Finally, the phenomenologists Guise Deleuze and uh, Felix Guattari 
discussion on the striated and the smooth becomes useful in designing interactions that balance authorship or fixed direction and then audience choice or agency. Analysis of narrative systems in open world electronic games reveal structures that oscillate between the fluid and the rigid. And likewise, the final image project proposes an architecture that maintains compositional integrity, yet allows for um, exploration and interpretation. Hello, everyone. I am Carol Okutniak, Associate Clinical Professor of Nursing at the College of Nursing and Health Professions. Uh, for over 10 years, Drexel College of Nursing has had a collaborative agreement with the Cal College of Nursing, Eternal University in Barus Saab, Himachal Pradesh in Northern India. Uh, we have done this collaborative agreement with the Cal College of Nursing with Dr. Jill Durstein, uh, Dr. Mary Lou McHugh, and most recently, Dr. Uh, Jane Green Ryan. We send faculty to the college with a graduate student from the nursing education tract at Drexel. We're there to share our standards of nursing practice with the administration, faculty, undergraduate, and graduate students at the college. And when I go, I go there to teach the faculty and students how to incorporate simulation education into their curriculum. Uh, next slide. Simulation in nursing is creating an environment that reproduces a real clinical setting where students can practice skills caring for patients. Uh, please uh, don't, don't, can you go back? Thank you. Um, reproduces a real clinical setting where students can practice skills caring for patients with any disease, disorder, or injury. And this photo here is the simulation lab at Drexel University. We have very, very sophisticated uh, simulation equipment. This mannequin in this photo, if purchased new, would cost approximately $100,000. And you can see in this photo, we have very sophisticated telemetry monitoring. We have simulated blood products, IV pumps and fluid, and we have an electronic health record. Uh, at a call College of Nursing, as you can see here in the upper left, um, there are very limited resources. Uh, so how do we teach simulation with the very limited uh, supplies and equipment that they have at the college? We bring our knowledge of simulation and adapt it to what is available at the college. On our last trip in 2018, Drexel College of Nursing donated two medical moulage kits with makeup and wounds made out of silicone. And then this photo, it is me making up the student volunteer. Uh, next photo. There are many things that we share with um, our colleagues in India. Uh, however, there are also cultural differences. And when we go there, I try to highlight the uh, cultural differences and help the students at a call to prepare for professional practice and things that they are gonna see. Um, this particular patient that I am making up in this photo, we have the students write the simulation scenarios for us. She was hit by a motor vehicle because she was texting on her phone while she was crossing the street. So that's something that we all have in common globally. Uh, here she is completely transformed into the patient. Next photo. Uh, the group of students in this photo wrote and acted out a simulation depicting a domestic violence incident. In this scene, the students portray all parts, their patient, doctor, nurse, husband, and mother-in-law. And in this scenario, the cause of the beating was due to the fact that the woman was carrying a female fetus and the husband wanted a son, so he beat her. She wound up in the hospital. We donated, um, you can do the next photo. We donated a simulating birthing belly to the college, and this is me. Uh, everyone was reluctant to wear the simulated birthing belly, so I took it upon myself. I'm portraying a pregnant woman in labor. Uh, next photo. We don't have uh, sophisticated audiovisual capture equipment when we go there, so we uh, bring the students uh, to the, the 
lab and the faculty come and view the simulation in person or I'll film it with my iPad and give the file to the college for future use. Uh, the next photo. In this photo, uh, the students, we donated this baby. This is a simulated newborn, and we're teaching the students how to practice neonatal resuscitation. Uh, the next slide. So this is one of our simulation scenarios. The entire student body for the junior level students are here, as, long as, uh, as well as the faculty um, and the graduate students in the nursing education program from McCall. In order to grow the program, we have to assess their needs, find donations, educate them on best practice and simulation science, implement the program, evaluate its effectiveness, and I cannot wait for the travel ban to be lifted. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Shea. Um, I am an assistant professor and the director of the Policy and Analytics Center, which is based at the AJ Drexel Autism Institute. And today I'm gonna to talk with you about um, a unique project that we're working on, which is funded by the International Society for Autism Research, which is really our guiding international body, um, convening autism researchers through an annual conference, which will be virtual this year. And also this is the um, third policy brief that INSAR has funded to date. So predominantly they are a research organization, but are increasingly seeking to extend the reach of their work into uh, real applied settings, which is very much aligned with our mission here at Drexel. For this project, uh, right now we have uh, 12 nations that we are partnering with across the world to understand, uh, improve and prevent interactions between people who are on the autism spectrum and the criminal justice system. To achieve that goal, we are taking four distinct steps. The first is that we're hosting an international summit, which is tentatively scheduled for October, although we may need to hold it virtually, of our 12 nations to come together and to use the sequential intercept model, which is a framework through the criminal justice system that outlines where and how people come into contact with the criminal justice system, starting with the community and working all the way through incarceration. We're also adapting that sequential intercept model specific to autism to account for the strengths as well as the deficits that the healthcare system currently uh, has to serve that population. We're conducting an international survey of individuals on the autism spectrum, their family members, and criminal justice system professionals about understanding autism. And when it comes into contact with the criminal justice system, how do those interactions go? What can we do to improve and prevent them? And to some extent, what is the prevalence of those interactions and characterizing how they occur as well? The final step of our project is to conduct a systematic literature review using the PRISMA framework to guide an analysis of the research base on autism spectrum disorders. There's a limited set of research that has begun to tackle this issue. Many of our partners across the world are leaders in this topic area. Um, so we are gathering all of the literature to put together an update as to the state of the state in where the literature currently stands. This is an example of the sequential intercept model. The initial design of the sequential intercept model was linear and had the intercepts side by side in a row. What we've done is reconfigured the sequential intercept model as a circle or a cycle to understand how the intercepts flow together to seek synergy between the intercepts for the sake of policy recommendations and also to gain efficiency in interpreting the value of the model. And we had a website, so we, the Drexel Autism Institute website is drexel.edu backslash autism. The Policy and Analytics Center information can be found there. Feel free to check it out and stay up to date with our work. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass over my screen to Elizabeth Watson um, as her presentation contains some videos that my computer could not download. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, thank you. So uh, my name is Elizabeth Watson, and I am a faculty member in the Department of Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Sciences, which the acronym for that is BEES. And um, in 2019, in the summer and fall, I had the absolute pleasure of living and doing research in uh, Baja, California. The focus of my research project um, that was supported by Fulbright was um, seagrass mapping. And so um, what this picture on the left shows is it shows um, a seagrass meadow in the foreground. Um, and the second goal of this project was to understand the value of carbon sequestration in coastal sediments in Baja, California. Um, while I didn't go to Mexico only for the food, I also wanted to highlight the really uh, amazing, some of the amazing culinary experiences I had. Um, for example, um, eating in a restaurant that was in a cave, um, eating champumines, which are um, uh, grasshoppers, and uh, learning to make wine in our artisan winery. Um, so uh, one of the really uh, amazing things about Baja California and the reason that I wanted to live and do research here is because the coastal environments are largely pristine compared to what you see in the United States. So this is some drone imagery I took of one of the, the lagoons, um, the one that was furthest north and most urbanized um, that I worked in in my time in, in Baja California. And so um, this is a place that well, you can see there's definitely urbanization fringing the lagoon and development and agriculture and things like that. You see these really amazing, intact, pristine coastal habitats that you just don't see to the same extent in the United States. So it's a really amazing opportunity to understand how these coastal ecosystems function um, without a lot of uh, development that necessarily disrupts the, you know, the sand dunes and the biology of the lagoon. Um, so um, this is, uh, shows some of the habitats uh, I worked in. It also shows um, the place that I live. So now we're kind of swinging around and you can see in the very far background, the research center that I worked at, which is called CISESE, which is in Ensenada and is a graduate um, research center. So it tends to um, have mainly uh, researchers and also um, mentors, graduate students, although there's no undergraduates. Um, and then over here, we're kind of swinging around and we're seeing some of the development um, fringing the lagoon. But one of the kind of amazing things is that um, instead of like building developments right on top of, you know, marshes and intertidal zones and things like that, in Baja California, for the most part, the development happens sort of around the lagoons. And so um, this is just not something that you see in the U.S. And it's really a function of how um, isolated um, Baja California was for a long time because it's lack of roads and then when the highway that traverses the um, the peninsula was constructed it really coincided with the development of the environmental movement and so there was a lot of effort that went into uh, a lot of blood sweat and tears into preserving these places. Um, another point out, thing I wanted to point out you know you don't have to go and live in another country to do international research but this really gave me an opportunity to deepen the connections I had with local faculty and also develop new partnerships with community organizations and conservation organizations um, that are active in Baja California. And then I also brought both of my children. Um, this is my son um, in Mexico City in front of uh, Diego Rivera mural. Um, he attended a school in Mexico. He attended a, a school that had a curriculum kind of focused on sustainability. Um, so he kind of had like a parallel experience that I had in my academic life. And we also got an opportunity to really um, explore Mexican culture. I've shown a few pictures of there on the right in a way that just hasn't been possible for me in the context of, you know, very short visits for doing field research. Um, so I feel like these experiences really are enriching my teaching. Um, I have connections with community organizations that I can invite to my classes um, to talk about their work. Um, this has enriched my mentoring. I have students that uh, work collaboratively with um, faculty members in, in Mexico and then also in my research. So I'd like you to thank you for sticking around to the end of the um, uh, Global Research Showcase and turn it back over to the uh,
Thank you so much. We made it, everyone. <laughs> um, I first want to see if there's any questions for any of our presenters. Um, Haley, if there's any questions, you can um, feel free to read them out, or if anyone has any questions, then submit to ha uh, Haley. Feel, please feel free to, to go ahead and, and unmute yourself. No questions sent to me, so. That's fine. Any, any questions from, from you all in the audience or for panel moderators for each other? Okay, well, thank you on behalf of, oh, go ahead, yes, please. I'm sorry. Hi, um, so uh, I'm a senior at Jackson University entrepreneurship major. I wanted to know, is this um, the research that they provided, is this open to um, like just students to use or is this like or open to the public or is this like only for um, certain purposes? Good question. So if you're interested in anyone's research in particular, um, yeah, I know sometimes faculty are searching for assistance from, from students. So definitely feel free to you know reach out to me or reach out to the faculty member directly. I should also mention that there were some presentations that were uh, selected for our website viewing. So there is some more research snapshots to look at at drexel.global, uh, sorry, drexel.edu slash global. Um, but don't know if there's anyone in particular that you're interested in working with, I would say feel free to to uh, email uh, him or her and let them know that you're interested in, in being engaged. Good question, okay. thank you for that. Thank you, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you all again for joining us this morning. I um, greatly appreciate you know, the, the breadth and depth of all the work that was presented. Um, you'll be able to find this recording on our website as well. And again, please check out drexel.edu slash global for uh, other uh, presentations that were not presented during the live showing today. Um, and a big thank you for, to Casey and Haley for keeping us on time and uh, putting our presentations together. So thank you all, take care. Thank you, take care everyone. See you.